praise the Lord. Would you join me in a word of prayer, Lord? We want to let you shine in our lives, Lord. But in order to do that, we need you in our lives, Lord. And so this time is very crucial and important that we get to spend in your word, Lord. So would you bless the teaching this evening? Bless Pastor J.D. Continue to watch over, guide, protect, and lead his family. Thank you again for this night. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Good evening. You guys were having way too much fun on that last song. I don't know. You could be seated. Glad you're here. Welcome. How you doing tonight? I don't need to ask you. I, that last song, some of you are going a little bit Pentecostal, but we won't say anything. Welcome to those of you online. You missed the whole thing. Sorry. Unless you were on our website. You were probably doing the same thing on the website. Anyway, praise the Lord. Wow, that was great. So glad you're here. We're going to uh, partake of communion together tonight. So if you haven't got the elements, you might want to do that at this time. Uh, we have two tables in the back, one up front. And uh, for those of you online, if you would like to participate and partake with us, then we would encourage you to get the elements ready at this time, so that at the conclusion of the Bible study, you can do so uh, with us at that time. I uh, want to mention a couple of things. Um, first, we're going to include the link to the Tuesday night prayer meeting teaching. That'll be on our website. Uh, in it, I shared a praise report about my wife, who, as many of you know, is battling breast cancer. And we're also going to include the link to last Thursday. Can you believe it's already been a week? when we had Pastor Steve Santos here. So uh, that link will be available as well for part two of Jesus Loves Lahaina. would encourage you to uh, view that. If you haven't, I know you will be richly blessed if you do. Um, you know what tonight is, right? What's happening tonight? We're finishing Ezekiel. Two chapters. I, I don't want to know, don't tell me uh, when we started Ezekiel, how long ago it was. It's been a while. We weren't in a hurry. Uh, but tonight, in our verse by verse study, we bring this book, this amazing book of Ezekiel to a conclusion. And it is a fascinating conclusion, as we're going to see in the very last chapter and the very last verse, the book ends with four words, all in caps, not angry caps, no emojis. They didn't have them then. But all in caps, four words, the Lord is there. I mean, magnificently and beautifully, it sums up the prophet Ezekiel and with him the book of Ezekiel. Now, you're going to have to roll up your arm sleeves again, because there are more measurements and allotments for which we would not really care, unless and until we knew that the Lord is there. Think of it like this. You're invited to something, a dinner or um, some sort of an event. And someone says to you in that invitation to you, hey, they're going to be there. They're going to be there? Well, then I'll be there. Or let's flip it around. You're invited to this thing, and uh, they're not going to be there. Oh, you know, I'm going to be busy that night. I won't be there either. But if you know who's going to be there, you're going to be there. And that's what these two chapters are all about. As we now see this crescendo of sorts towards the end of the book, leading up to the end of the book with these last four words. Because I, 
I think you agree with me when I say this. If the Lord is there, I want to be there. Let me say the same thing in a different way. I want to be where the Lord is. And conversely, if the Lord's not there, I'm not interested. Well, the Lord's not going to be there? I'm not going. If, if the Lord's not going to be there, but if the Lord's going to be there, I'll be there early, because <laughs> the Lord's going to be there. And that should really be, for lack of a better way of saying it, the caption on all of our lives and on everything in our lives. Is the Lord in it? Is the Lord there? If the Lord is there, then as we're about to see what's going to come as a result of the Lord being there. And now we get again into, and we're just going to get through it, and I'll do my best in so doing, but a lot of seemingly mundane details with all the measurements and the allotments in this description of this literal temple during the millennium in Jerusalem, and the allotment of lots to the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, and the location, the measurements, and the location of where the holy place is going to be, where the prince is going to be, where the 12 tribes are going to be, and then of course, more importantly, infinitely more importantly, where the Lord is going to be and what's going to come as a result of that. So you ready? Let's do it. Verse 1. Then he, this is that tour guide that we were introduced to, chapter 40, brought me, speaking of Ezekiel, back to the door of the temple. And there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the front of the temple faced east, the water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. He brought me, verse 2, out by the way of the north gate, and led me around on the outside to the outer gateway that faces east, and there was water running out on the right side. Where the Lord is, there is the water of life, and water as a type of the abundant life, a life full to overflowing, powerful as torrents of living water, the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. And we're going to see that here in just a moment. I want to allegorize it too much, because this is literally, there's literally going to be a water source. And this is the water of life. And verse 3, when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The water came up to my ankles. Verse 4, again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters. The water came up to my knees. This is getting deep. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the water, came up to my waist. That's deeper. Again, verse 5, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross. Watch this, for the water was too deep. Water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. Now, I want to draw upon an illustration that I've used uh, over the years. And um, was it Sunday or it couldn't have been last week? It's pretty bad when the pastor doesn't remember what he taught on the week before. But so the illustration of the power of the Holy Spirit likened unto trying in your own strength to get that canoe off the sand on the beach and into the water. And you're pushing and you're struggling. And this thing isn't moving. So you call all the brothers over to help you. And they're pushing and they're struggling. And it's still barely moving. And then all of a sudden, here comes the tide. And you can take your pinky and just push on that canoe that heretofore you could not move. And the water effortlessly takes it out by the power of that flow in that tide, 
takes it out into the water. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And there are certain things that we cannot do. Ezekiel says, I could not cross this. It was so deep. In other words, the only way that this was going to happen was by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's exemplified, illustrated in this water flowing from the, the temple. Let me say it like this, where the Lord is, there is life. This is the water of life. Where the Lord is, there is the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. If the Lord is there, life is there, and the power of the Holy Spirit is there. Verse 6, He said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then He brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. When I returned there along the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other. Then He said to me, verse 8, This water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley, and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, listen to this, its waters are healed. You know what this is talking about? <laughs> Check this out. For those of you that have been to Israel, the Dead Sea, you know why it's called the Dead Sea? Because it's dead, and it's a sea. Nothing lives in it. Remember when we would float in it? You, it, it, the salt content is so off the charts high, nothing can live in it, which is why they call it the Dead Sea. And he, you can't swim in it, you just float in it and read the paper, which that's, I need to update my, my <laughs> examples. But uh, this is talking about the Dead Sea. Wait a minute. Pastor, are you saying that the, the Dead Sea, no, it's no longer the Dead Sea. This sea is alive. You mean there, the, that's going to be there? Surely this is, this is metaphorically speaking. This is, this, is, this is spiritualized. This is not literal. No, it's literal. You don't have this specificity, as we're going to see even more so just in chapter 47, then again in chapter 48. But you don't see that kind of specificity if it's just figuratively. No, there's, I mean, I cannot wait to see this sea. <laughs> I know that's a play on words, but it's not dead anymore. It's alive. And the waters are healed. Where the Lord is, there will healing be there will life be. And there's going to be life in this sea. And look at verse 9, it shall be that, I love this, every living thing that moves wherever the rivers go will live. And it gets better. There will be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters go there, for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. Did you catch that? So the Lord is there, life is there, healing is there, and wherever it goes, that's where the river goes. Let me say it like this. If the Lord's going in this direction, that's where I want to go. I want to go where He goes. Wherever He goes, that's where I'm a-going. And there's life, and there's healing. And oh, by the way, I guess there's going to be some big fish to be caught. No, this is not met metaphorical again. It's not spiritual. This is not, th this is really going to happen. And, and by the way, spoiler alert, we're going to talk, we're going to get down to the nitty and gritty, because there's going to be work. Now, before your heart sink, <laughs> wait a minute, there's going to be work during the millennium? Yeah. There's going to even be work in heaven. Are you sure that's not the other place? Work in heaven? Hang on to that. 
we're going to come back to that. So there's going to be fishing there. And no more need, no need for big fish stories. You know, I caught a fish this big, however you guys do it. No, you won't need to, because it will really be that big. Great in size, great in multitude. <laughs> it gets better. Verse 10, It shall be that the fishermen, told you, will stand by it from, watch the specificity, and Getty, remember En Gedi? To En Glaim, they will be places for spreading their nets. Oh, I thought they were going to use poles. No nets, that's what they use. Their fish will be of the same kinds as the fish of the great sea, exceedingly many. But, now this is interesting, verse 11, its swamps and marshes will not be healed. Wait, they will be given over to salt. Wait, what? I thought we got rid of the salt. The Dead Sea is not the Dead Sea anymore, because there's no more salt anymore. No, there's still salt. And by the way, we want there to be salt. Why? Because salt flavors. Where the Lord is, there is flavor. And this is diametrically opposed to what the world's lies are about Christians. Oh my goodness, before I come to Christ, I'm going to have all my fun now, because we all know that when you become a Christian, boring. It's all vanilla, and you know, it's just, no. You haven't lived until you come to Christ. Hey, you, you think, you, we're going to see this in Daniel, not next week, Lord willing. If we're still here, Lord willing, the following week, where we're going to see this amazing man. He's young at the time. He will be there in Babylon. And for some believe, the entirety of the 70 years, and if he's 20 at the time, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're not in Daniel yet. Just hang tight. But he's going to live to be in his 90s. What a life. But the Christian life is life. And life more abundantly, Jesus said, I've come to give you life and more abundantly. You think you're, man, this is living the life. If you're not saved, you're not living the life. Or how about this saying, oh, this is how the other half lives. To which I say, if that's how the other half lives that are not saved, I'm good where I'm at on this side, because that ain't living. I mean, you talk about flavor. I, I did not know flavor until I came to Christ. I mean, I thought I was living the life. And you know, I don't want to get too uh, detailed on my life before Christ. But when I came to Christ, you want to talk about flavor and color and meaning and purpose. Because salt flavors. You know what else salt does? You know what salt does. It preserves and protects. So yeah, I'll take me some of that salt. So it's going to, there's going to be salt there. And salt is life too, by the way, in the original language. This word salt is not just, you know, the salt, sea salt. This is life giving salt. You've heard the expression that they would actually pay the salary back in those ancient times with salt, because it was so valuable. And that's where we got the expression, that man's worth his salt. Did you ever wonder where that expression came from? I just told you. Now you know. Now you can tell people who don't know that you know, so they'll know. And they'll think, wow, how'd you know? Okay, that was enough of that. Verse 12. How are we doing so far? We good? Verse 12. Along the bank of the river, on this side and that, will grow all kinds of trees used for food, their leaves will not wither, and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month, because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for medicine. I knew it. No, for real. Now some of you are into this, and you already know about this. 
But God made certain plants, certain foods even. Oh, how's this one? If you want to do some research, I think you will just be flabbergasted by how, I mean, you would talk about how we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you know that some fruits and vegetables were created by God specific to the parts of our bodies that they are medicinal and healthy for? Example, we know that carrots are good for the eyes. When you cut the carrot, you see what is the shape of an eye. Celery, the bones. Walnuts, the brain. I need more walnuts, I think. <laughs> right? Can I get a witness and an amen on that one? I need to eat more almonds. It's the shape of a tomato, the chambers, the heart. Uh, there's another word. Oh, uh, I want to be careful on this one. Um, avocados, the female reproductive uh, system. There's another one that's uh, really um, amazing. I mean, of course, <laughs> as only God can. But they've actually done studies of how these specific fruits and vegetables are also fearfully and wonderfully made for us, because we're fearfully and wonderfully made, and they're good for us. You know how many of these herbs and, well, I'll give you, a, here's another example. Are we okay? Is this too much? Okay, well, this is really cool. So, um, and no extra charge too. So, uh, you know, when the uh, wise men, which they, we don't no, there were three. In fact, some believe there were an entourage and many of these wise men that came from the East, what we would know today as uh, Iran or Persia. And they brought the Savior, Joseph and Mary actually. And by the way, He wasn't a babe in the manger. When they get to Bethlehem, He's already in a house. So he's already maybe, we don't know how much time has passed, but he's not a babe. He's a toddler at this time. And they come, so I'm sorry about your manger scenes. I know we're a little ways away from Christmas, but uh, I totally ruined mine. We don't even take it out anymore after I realized that and taught it. You know, here's the we three kings from Orient are. You guys aren't even there. Out of here. Get out of there. So we're down to a few animals. <laughs> yeah. This is kind of like, well then just why bother? There's a lot of, you know, anyway. But do you know why they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Frankincense is medicinal. So is myrrh. Um, the gold financial provision for the journey to Egypt, which God would have them go to, to protect them from Herod, who wanted to kill the baby under two years of age, the Hebrew boy, of which all the Hebrew boys at that time of that age were butchered in unspeakable ways. But that cost money, and travel in that day was very expensive and just very harsh. And so the gold, and don't imagine just, you know, here's a, a few you know, gold coins. No, they brought, man, they brought some gold. I mean, this is God incarnate. What, God the Father isn't going to provide for Joseph and Mary? I mean, the, a Savior is born to Joseph and Mary. You're going to need some financial provision. I got some gold coming from Persia, <laughs> lots of it, big whole wagon on this entourage, and you're going to have all the gold you need, all the finances you need, because you're going to raise the Son of God, God the Son. These were, the, the gold is secondary, but what I really wanted to focus in on and draw your attention to was the medicinal, because she had just given birth. So she needed that frankincense and myrrh. Do you know that if you apply topically frankincense on cancer, topically, it shrinks it. Did you know that? Oh, you didn't know that? 
Well, now there's something else you know that you can tell somebody who doesn't know, so they'll know. And that you, I'm not going to do that again. You got the point. This is going to be in the millennium. These, these, these trees, and there's going to be a lot of them, are going to be medicinal. Well, wait a minute. I thought we were going to have our glorified bodies. No, they won't. They're going to have bodies like Adam and Eve, flesh and blood. And so there's going to be death in the millennium. It'll be very rare. There's going to be sickness in the millennium. And, but this is preventive. <laughs> I don't even want to go there. If modern medicine today, eh, no. No, right? Yeah. Verse 13, thus says the Lord, I'm sorry, you'll forgive me. No, it's good that I don't. Verse 13, thus says the Lord God, these are the borders by which you shall divide the land as an inheritance among the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph shall have two portions. Now remember he had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, which by the way, the names are the nature. Manasseh, it's actually the same basic root word in Arabic, but inseh, to, to forget, forget wrongs. Manasseh, to forget. Uh, Ephraim is to be fruitful. Here's Joseph that is forgiving and forgetting what was done to him by his brothers. And here's Joseph now naming his two sons, forgiving, forgetting, and fruitful, because God had made him so prosperous and so fruitful. So these two portions are for Joseph's two sons. Verse 14, you shall inherit it equally with one another. For I raise my hand in an oath, like we would do, to give it to your fathers, and this land shall fall to you as your inheritance. This shall be the border, verse 15, of the land on the north from the great sea, by the road to Hephlon, as one goes to Sedad, Hamath, Berothah, Zipraim, which is between the border of Damascus and the border of Hamath, to Hazar Hatikon, which is on the border of Hauron. Now again, why do we need to know this? Pretty sure this isn't a life verse for anybody. You don't have verse 15 or 16, which is parenthetical, by the way, on your wall or wallpaper. Well, again, this is, this is really detailed. Well, I'll tell you why. It's because these borders that are going to be Israel in the millennium will be really the land that was theirs all along that they never possessed. You know, the most of the promised land, and by the way, the promised land, parts of Egypt, my birthplace in Lebanon. Uh, you, you look at a map, <laughs> the Muslims will call it the Levant. They won't ever call it Israel. Uh, it is huge. And the most they ever possessed of the Promised Land was under the rule of King David. And it was at best a tenth of the borders of the Promised Land originally given to Israel. So I, I suppose you could say that God is making up for that which they did not possess prior. So in the millennium, they got it all. That, the Damascus, Syria, yeah, that's part of it too. And all the way into parts of Egypt. And we're going to see now verse 17, thus the boundary shall be from the sea to Hazar, Enan, the border of Damascus. And as for the north, now we're going north, northward. It is the border of Hamath. This is the north side. This is a lot of land. It was theirs to begin with. On the east side, verse 18, you shall mark out the border from between Hauran and Damascus and between Gilead and the land of Israel along the Jordan. Oh yeah, by the way, the, the so-called Palestinians, which they're not, they're Arabs, want a Palestinian state. You do have one already. It's called Jordan. No, actually it is. 
My mom was born in, in Jordan, El Husn, Jordan, very small town outside of Amman, the capital. But do you realize the promised land encompassed Jordan in part? Modern day Jordan. And along the eastern side of the sea, this is the east side, the south side, let's go south now, toward the south, shall be from Tamar to the waters of Meribah, by Kadesh along the brook to the great sea. This is the south side toward the south. The west side shall be the great sea from the southern boundary until one comes to a point opposite Hamath. This is the west side. Thus you shall divide this land among yourself according to the tribes of Israel. Finally, it took till the millennium, but Israel is going to get their land promised to them by God, who made a covenant with them that He would bring them into this land. You might say God got the final word on this one and made it right. Took a while, <laughs> but we're going to right the wrong now. It shall be that you will divide it by lot, not rolling, casting lots. No, this is like lot size. And I, I assure you in the millennium, it's going to be bigger than the lot sizes in Kailua, 5,000 square feet. We're, we're, that's, that's nothing. That's maybe for the, the toilet. I'm sorry. I could have used a different. I'm just trying to you know, put it into perspective. So huge lots. And this is an inheritance. This is their, their inheritance. <laughs> it's theirs. It was given to them, for them, for yourselves, and for the, now watch this one, for the strangers who dwell among you and who bear children among you. Wait a minute. Are we talking about immigrants? Oh, don't look at me like that. I have to say this. I'll be careful about how I say it, but I have to say it. My parents immigrated legally to the United States when I was nine months old from the Middle East. And I praise God that they did. I don't know if I would have been saved, yet alone, let alone alive, had they not. Because America represented safety, sanctuary, and salvation. And had we not been, and by the way, did you know, I know this is going to, I've already ruined Christmas. I might as well ruin something else while I'm at it. Uh, you know, these are people, right? You know that, right? That are crossing the border that Jesus died for, that need Jesus. Um, in Israel, the Israelites were to allow the foreigner, the immigrant, to come into the land, and they were to treat them right and take care of them. I think we do err greatly when we make the immigrant the enemy. Now don't get me wrong, and don't email me either. I know that there are very wicked and evil and dangerous people that are crossing that border. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about families who are leaving places that you could never imagine. A dirt floor with maybe some sort of protective covering over it, and no money, and no water, and no food. And they're fleeing an area for their lives. They're running for their lives. I know my parents left the Middle East to flee Islam, because they were not Muslims. And it was a matter of life and death. And for me, it would be a matter of me coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ by coming to America. This is a, talk about, let's talk about fishing out of a bucket. You know that expression? What a great evangelistic opportunity. But no, we're going to take a political posture. Wait a minute. Uh, that's wrong. Did you notice that Ezekiel is inspired to write as the tour guide shows him this, 
that these strangers, immigrants who dwell among you and bear children among you. These are families. These are children. And they don't stand a fighting chance. This is the mission field brought to us instead of us going to them. I'm not going to rant on and on about it. I just wanted to share my heart about that. I think we're missing it. And that's not God's heart. These are people that Jesus died for, and they need Jesus. Okay. They shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. They shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. What? They're not getting my inheritance. And that shall be that in whatever tribe the stranger dwells, there you shall give him his inheritance, says the Lord God. That's how chapter 47 ends. Now we're going to slide into chapter 48, verse 1. Now these are the names of the tribes from the northern border along the road to Heflon at the entrance of Hamath to Hazar Enan, the border of Damascus northward, in the direction of Hamath, there shall be one section for Dan, from its east to its west side, by the border of Dan, from the east side to the west, one section for Asher, by the border of Asher. Now you see what's happening here? So we got the land, and we've got the measurements, the allotments, and now we're going to see who it is going to be given to. So now we got Asher. These are all the, can I just make one comment? I was thinking about this this last week. And I don't mean to say this to sound, it's conviction, not condemnation. And I, and I include myself in this. I wonder how many of us can name 12 famous people, actors, um, artists, uh, recording artists, as they call them, um, TV stars, rock stars, but we, we, 12 of them, you could list them, not you, I'm not going to, I'm talking about other carnal Christians. <laughs> that was a good save, wasn't it? They can name minimum 12 famous people, but ask them to name even five of the disciples. Or how about three of the twelve tribes for the Gospels? Again, I don't want to sound condemning, convicting, that's the Holy Spirit. Condemning, that's not the Holy Spirit. Because conviction draws you nearer to the Lord, and condemnation distances you further from the Lord. But think about this, just for, just for a second. Let this, just kind of, let the Holy Spirit have access to your heart on this, because the biblical illiteracy, I mean, I, can I just be very candid with you and say that I feel sorry for people. Uh, they're in for a, a, a rude awakening during the millennium. Who's that? You don't know who that is? That's Asher. That's my, that's my buddy Asher. Who's Asher? He was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Who's Jacob? Get out of here. <laughs> Are you kidding me right now? They don't know, and they're going to be foreigners to them. They, they don't, how, how many of, can I flip it around? I better, because some of you are looking at me like, wow, that's really mean, because I'm very convicted. Well, so am I. But how about for those of us that have been students of God's Word, certainly teachers of God's Word, and we've gotten to know people like Ezekiel. I mean, I feel like I know this guy. Jeremiah before him, Isaiah. How about the New Testament? I feel like I've known Peter all my life <laughs> for reasons that I don't need to explain, and some of you too. I mean, we identify with Him. We know Him from His epistles, from the Gospels. I, we have a very 
good understanding and familiarity with Paul the Apostle. I mean, we've been through all of the epistles, the book of Acts alone. I mean, we were introduced to Saul of Tarsus, who God just, I mean, gets a hold of, and now he's Paul the Apostle. And he writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit, all of these epistles. I, I can't, by the way, this is just a little side note. I know, have I had a lot of side notes tonight? This is one more, and then we'll end. No, I can't say that, because I can't promise that. But I, I, I think we're going to know, because I feel like I know who the writer of Hebrews is. Yeah. We're going to know. Yeah, I knew it. They're going to have to put him in like protect, protective custody, you know, and I, a witness protection program, along with the last Gentile that gets saved. I'm fully convinced that they're going to have to be in, you know, a witness protection program for all of eternity, because we're going to, if they had a name tag, I'm the last Gentile that was holding up things before the rapture. Yeah. Name tag. Yeah. That wouldn't be good. I'll just leave that to your imagination. Don't take that too far. So back to our Bible study already in progress, where we've got Asher. These are real people, real tribes, 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. By the way, when we get to Revelation, which we are, Lord willing, if the rapture doesn't happen first, which we will not complain, we're going to be in Daniel next Thursday, and Revelation, not this Sunday, the following Sunday. <laughs> Only God could have arranged and timed that. Um, but in Revelation, the, the 12 disciples' names are going to be in the New Jerusalem. And the 12 tribes' names are going to be in the millennium on the temple. So I'd like to introduce you to them, if you don't know them, because you're going to get to know them. And it would probably be good if you knew them, so you don't have to, like, you know, look at their name tag. Hi, my name is Asher. Oh, you're a, hi. I heard about you that one night, Bible study, Pastor JD took us through. And just, anyway, took it too far, as he always does. But anyway, it won't matter then. So Asher, from the east side to the west, one section for Naphtali, by the border of Naphtali, from the east side to the west, one section, here's Manasseh, by the border, verse 5 of Manasseh, from the east side to the west, one section for Ephraim, by the border of Ephraim, from the east side to the west, one section for Reuben. This was the firstborn son of Jacob by the border of Reuben, from the east side to the west. One section for, don't forget Judah. He was one of the sons. <laughs> from whom the Savior of the world would come, from the lion of the tribe of Judah. See, I wouldn't have done that. I would have absolutely, without question, had the Savior of the world come from Joseph's lineage, not Judah. Do you know what Judah did? It's not good bad stuff. Have you seen the genealogy of the Savior of the world recorded in Matthew and Luke? It's not for the faint at heart. I mean, you, you want to talk about these family trees. By the way, th this whole Ancestry.com, you know, that's is that still a thing? I'm a f f so afraid to do my, I don't want to know, you know, how would that be that, I, you know, my great, great, whatever, grandfather's uncle was Yasser Arafat or something like that. <laughs> See, I, you know, ignorance is bliss when it comes to that for guys like me. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. But Judah, his uh, lineage, not good. But from him would come the Savior of the world. Why do I point that out? Because <laughs> Jesus came for those people. Aren't you glad that the Savior of the, of the world didn't come from, as they say, good breeding stock of noble birth, as Paul would write? I mean, well, of course, the Savior of the world is going to come from that family tree. 
No, he came from Judah. How sordid is Judah's family tree? I mean, that's all the farther I'm going to take that one. By the border of Judah, from the east side to the west, shall be the district which you shall set apart, 25,000 cubits in width, and in length the same as one. The other portions from the east side to the west, with the sanctuary in the center, where it should be. The district that you shall set apart for the Lord shall be 25,000 cubits in length, and 10,000 in width. To these, to the priests, the holy district shall belong. On the north, 25,000 cubits in length. On the west, 10,000 in width. On the east, 10,000 in width. And on the south, 25,000 in length. The sanctuary of the Lord shall be in the center where it should be. Where the Lord is, should be at the center of my life. The centrality of Jesus Christ in my life is crucial if I want to live my life for Christ, in Christ, and for His glory. Verse 11, it shall be for the priests of the sons of Zadok, who are sanctified, who have kept my charge, who did not go astray when the children of Israel went astray, as the Levites went astray. In other words, you fired. I'm going to get, not that harsh, but I'm going to give it to, to Zadok, because you guys went astray when the Israelites went astray. But Zadok, the sons of Zadok, didn't. They remain loyal. And this district, verse 12, of land that is set apart shall be to them a thing most holy by the border of the Levites. Opposite the border of the priests, verse 13, the Levites shall have an area, <laughs> 25,000 cubits in length, and 10,000 in width. Its entire length shall be 25,000, and its width 10,000. By the way, this is huge, okay? The cubit, 22 inches approximately, 22 times 25,000. You can do that at home. Don't do it right now. And verse 14, they shall not sell or exchange any of it. They may not alienate the best part of the land, for it is holy to the Lord. There's kind of a veiled reminder, sanctified of course, of how they gave, I've heard it said this way, this is very good, don't give to man what God gave to you. That's what they were doing. Uh, more modern day, land for peace. No, that you can't give that to them. That's my land. I gave it to you and you're giving it to them. Verse 15, the 5,000 cubits in width that remain along the edge of the 25,000 shall be for general use by the city. How practical is this? For dwellings and common land, and the city shall be in the center. These, verse 16, shall be its measurements. The north side, 4,500 cubits. The south side, 4,500 cubits. The east side, 4,500. And the west side, 4,500. I think that's pretty even on all sides. The common land, verse 17, of the city shall be to the north 250 cubits, to the south 250, to the east 250, and to the west 250. The rest of the length alongside the district of the holy section shall be 10,000 cubits to the east and 10,000 to the west. It shall be adjacent to the district of the holy section. And here it is, its produce shall be food for the workers of the city. There's going to be work there. The Lord is there. Why is there work there? Well, you'll see. Verse 19, the workers of the city from all the tribes of Israel shall cultivate it. That's a lot of work. The entire district shall be 25,000 cubits by 25,000 cubits, four square. You shall set apart the holy district with the property of the city. Verse 21, the rest shall belong to the prince. We know we talked about this. I believe this is David. On one side and on the other, the holy district, and on the city's property next to the 25,000 cubits of the holy district, as far as the eastern border, and westward next to the 25,000, as far as the western border, adjacent to the tribal portion. Are you getting this? 
It shall belong to the prince. It shall be the holy district, and the sanctuary of the temple shall be in the center where it should be. Moreover, verse 22, apart from the possession of the Levites and the possession of the city, which are in the midst of what belongs to the prince, the area between the border of Judah and the border of Benjamin, the youngest, by the way, Joseph and Benjamin were biological brothers, the two youngest brothers. Remember the whole account of when Joseph sent them back to bring back their youngest son, and Jacob is like, no, I lost Joseph, who he believed was dead, and now Benjamin. And he says those, I mean, just stabbing words, everything is against me. Oh, if he only knew what lay ahead. Joseph is alive, a type of Jesus. And Benjamin, Joseph wanted to know, Joseph and Benjamin were very close. Joseph wanted to know, first thing he asks is, is your father still alive? Deep down inside, he's like, he's dead, he's dead, dead. But he doesn't say it like that. And then he asks, uh, do you have any more brothers? Yeah, we got the youngest one. He's at home. Oh, how, how's he doing? <laughs> they don't know it's Joseph. That's my youngest brother. We were, I haven't seen him in 17 years. Is he okay? Bring him back. So I don't, because I think they're spies. He knows they're not spies. They're his brothers. So this is Benjamin. And by the way, Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, is where Jerusalem proper is, the tribe of Benjamin. So as for the rest of the tribes from the east side to the west, Benjamin shall have one section by the border of Benjamin from the east side to the west. Simeon shall have one section. I wouldn't have given him a section. You think Judah was bad. You know, it's, I'm not going to tell you what Simeon did. You can find out. Read it for yourself. By the border of Simeon, from the east side to the west, Issachar shall have one section. By the border of Issachar, from the east side to the west, Zebulun shall have one section. By the border of Zebulun, from the east side to the west, Gad shall have one section. By the border of Gad, on the south side toward the south, the border shall be from Tamar to the waters of Meribah by Kadesh, along the brook to the great sea. This is the land you shall divide by lot as an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. And these are their portions, says the Lord God. Now, just when you thought it was over, he needs to now show us where the exit signs are going to be. Verse 30, these are the exits of the city. On the north side, measuring 4,500 cubits, the gates of the city shall be named after the tribes of Israel. That's going to be pardon me, replicated in the book of Revelation, when we see the names of the 12 disciples, the 12 tribes, 12 the number of government, the three gates northward, one gate for Reuben, one gate for Judah, one gate for my son Levi. I mean Levi. I just want to make sure you're still with We're almost done. On the east side, verse 32, 4,500 cubits, Three gates, one gate for Joseph, one gate for Benjamin, one gate for Dan on the south side, measuring 4,500 cubits. Three gates, one gate for Simeon, one gate for Issachar, one gate for Zebulun. On the west side, verse 34, 4,500 cubits with their three gates, one gate for Gad, one gate for Asher, and one gate for Naphtali. All the way around, verse 35, shall be 18,000 cubits and wait for it. The name of the city from that day shall be, the Lord is there. I want to live in that city. You know, welcome to Kaneohe. They don't have that, do they? I know Kailua, they do still, unless there's graffiti on it. Welcome to Kailua town. Welcome to the Lord is there. All right. Did that work? I want to talk about work. What if I told you that work was blessed before the fall? So work as we know work 
in the flesh is going to be nothing like work is going to be for all of eternity. We're going to be working for all eternity. When Adam and Eve were given the job to work the garden, work was blessed before it was cursed. Then when sin entered, the curse was the, you'll work, Adam, by the sweat of your brow. That's when work became cursed. But work was not cursed. Work was blessed. So here, here's what I'm thinking, and I won't take too long on this, because I really want to take the remainder of our time to celebrate communion. But I want to leave you with this. In heaven, just think about the thing that you enjoy doing more than anything else that's going to be your job in heaven. And it won't be a got to, it'll be a get to. And you won't be punching a clock, no need. You're in eternity, there's no time. But it, it is going to be so satisfying. It just, you know, sometimes when, when people retire, particularly men, they'll have a heart attack close in proximity to their retirement. You know about this? See, God designed us to work and to derive great satisfaction from the work of our hands. So work in heaven, I don't know, I've, I know I've talked about this, I've, I'm speculating, because I want to know what my job description is. What am I going to be doing in heaven? Now, I, I've got, you know, some horrible thoughts about God's going to say, I want you to go and you're going to arrange paper clips for, you know, <laughs> most of eternity, but since there's no end to it, it's forever and ever. I'll, I'll probably move you up from the mail room. You won't have to do that anymore. Might move you into charts and analytics, you know, where, because I love that. I love organizing charts and, you know, <laughs> as you know, because all the prophecy updates have at least, by the way, Sunday, I have a chart again. It's not, it's not really a chart. It's kind of like a, a list. Okay, it's a chart still. But I, I just like to organize things. I just say, there's such a great satisfaction. I have these organizers. I said I wasn't going to go very long. Yeah, one more. So I have these organizers that I, I like to, I like to, or, my wife says to me, so she, you know how opposites, and, and you're opposite because if you were both alike, one of you would be unnecessary. <laughs> Did you ever think about that? No, well, that's what my wife tells me anyway. So I just, I have to go with it. But so she'll give me something, she'll say, can you organize this? And I'm, I'm looking at I'm going, how do you live like this? I mean, everything has to, and then so, so, so here's what she does. I have everything, you know, I'm one of those. I, I know. You, you're, some of you are like that too. You know who you are. You like everything to, and it has to be organized. And, you know, if it's crooked, it, it you just, you can't think about anything else. It's crooked. It's crooked. So you straighten it. Okay, it's straightened now. Okay, now I can function again. And here comes my wife, right? She goes, <laughs> 35 years of marriage will do this to you. She'll look at that thing and she'll go, wow. <laughs> you know, I can't get mad at her. You know, I just look at it and say, and so I give her a courtesy laugh. You know what a courtesy laugh is? <laughs> Anyway, I, there was a, a profound, deep point and truth that I was going to, you know, impart to you concerning, oh, I like to do that. And I just wonder in heaven if the Lord's going to say, I, know, I knew, I made you like that, by the way. I wired you that way. I know you derive great satisfaction. So He's going to let me for all eternity, there's going to be this huge mess. <laughs> and you say, I want you to organize it. Really? All right. And then you're going to be doing whatever you do. I'll leave that between you and the Lord. So don't laugh at me. You walk by, say, hi. Wow, look at that mess. You're going to organize that. I know, but I love doing this. And you're over there doing that. I'm going, I could never do that. The Lord knew that. That's why you're not doing that. Is that enough? Work's going to be blessed in heaven. What do you think we're going to be sitting around doing? Nothing? Worshiping? We're going to be worshiping for all of eternity. It's not going to be like, oh, no, it's going to be, we were made to worship. And we, it, it's going to be, 
there, there was gonna, anyway, it's, it's too glorious for any, any of us to comprehend. But I just, I just want to leave you with this. Work is going to be a blessing, as it was originally meant to be for all of eternity. And we're going to have work to do, and we're going to produce these, these, the produce of these workers. We're going to be productive for all of eternity. No deadlines, no sales quotas. We're going <laughs> to, no pressure. We're just going to produce and be productive and work, and it's going to be glorious forever and ever. All right. Well, I didn't leave as much time as I wanted to, but I want to now uh, turn a corner and go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, with the account known as what we affectionately refer to as the Last Supper, when the hour had come, Luke writes, he, speaking of Jesus, sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He says it twice, notice. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you'll take, for those of you here, the packaging, and just remove the top, you'll have the bread, and just hold on to it for a moment. Those of you online, if you'll just get the bread and, and um, hang on to it for a moment so we can partake together. This is a symbol, you know that we hold in our hands, a symbol of the body of Jesus Christ, broken, not the bones, the body, the skin. Broken in seven places, by the way, the number of completion, it is finished. The work of the cross is completed. Seven. He was broken in seven places, and He bled from seven places when His blood was shed in our stead, which we'll celebrate and commemorate with the cup. But his body was broken, as the Passover lamb's body had to be broken in order for the blood to be shed. And Jesus is the fulfillment of that Passover prophecy. What's the Passover? The Passover is the angel of death passes over us. If we have the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of our house, our Christian lives, our lives, and the blood in the shape of a cross, so that death passes over and we're saved. So this is just a celebration, much in the same way that Ezekiel describes the offerings during the millennium. They're celebratory. They're a commemoration and a celebration of what Jesus did. See, they missed out on all that. They had the temple, but they didn't have Jesus. They had Jerusalem, but they did not have Jesus. They had the land, not in whole, but they didn't have Jesus. And so they missed out on it. And the Lord doesn't want them to be robbed of that. So for the millennium, He's going to allow them to enjoy that which they did not prior. It's all a, a memorial, a remembrance of those sacrifices, the offerings during the millennium. It's all to remember what Jesus did. And this is what Jesus is saying, I want you to do this as often as you do. You can do it as often as you want. But when you do it, as often as you do it, I just want you to remember what I did for you, my body broken for you. Would you partake with me? Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank You for giving us this to do. In remembrance of You, we get so caught up in the cares and the affairs of our busy and stressful lives. And 
we forget, we don't remember that we have eternal life, because you gave your life. Lord, thank you for just recalibrating us. This is a, a refocusing, a, a recalibrating, a, a resetting, bringing us back to the cross where you died for our sins and paid in full to purchase us and offer to us the gift of eternal life in so doing. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for this much needed reminder. Luke goes on to write, likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant, new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. So again, for those of you here, if you'll peel back the remainder of the packaging and just hold on to it. Again, a symbol that we hold in our hands, this the blood, a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the blood of the new covenant. What does that mean? Well, see the old covenant, it was only a covering, kofar in the Hebrew. It wasn't a removing of sin, a cleansing of sin. It was only the covering of sin in the old covenant until Jesus came and fulfilled the old covenant not did away with it, fulfilled it with the new covenant in His blood. So now, instead of covering the sin, hey, I'll take covering, but remission, removing, as far as the east is from the west, though they be as scarlet and remembered no more, I'll take that. How about the, just the remembering, notice, notice the irony of this. We're to do this in remembrance of Him who remembers not what we did. He remembers them no more. Aren't you glad? I wish I could forget. No, we still remember them, because if we forgot, then what goes out with that is the forgetting of what Jesus did for those sins. Again, it's not a condemnation. It's, it's just the one who's been forgiven of much, loves much. Proportionate to how much I've been forgiven, I will love. And when I remember how much Jesus has forgiven me of, and the sins He has paid for, I just respond in kind. And that's why it is that we don't go back into the, the guilt of them, for there is therefore now no guilt or condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1. But it's just the remembrance and the conviction, but then the celebration that Jesus paid for that. So here's what that looks like, and then we'll partake. Watch this. So Satan comes and he reminds you of some horrible sin. You know, not, doesn't have to be that far in the past. It might have been, I don't want to look at anybody when I say it. Don't look at the person sitting next to you when I say this. That sin just last week, and he's constantly condemning you and trying to build this infrastructure of guilt. Because again, he wants to distance you from the Lord. But you need do nothing but get to the cross as quickly as you can where that sin was paid for. So here's what it looks like. Yeah, I sinned, but God paid for it. It's paid for. I've been forgiven. And this blood that He shed as a symbol in our hands is a reminder that it's paid for. I have no outstanding debt. I will not have to pay for that. But see, Satan wants us to think, well, man, you're going to pay for that one. Now, that's not to say there's not consequences. But sometimes in God's mercy, He spares us and does not pay us as our sins deserve. 
And He's just gracious and merciful to us. Sometimes the consequences are what it takes, because sin is its own reward. And when you taste from the consequences and drink from the cup of the consequences of your sin, it has the much needed effect of, of deterring you from that. Because the bitterness of that lingers on longer after the short pleasure of that sin, the bitterness of it, the sorrow, the godly sorrow that leads to a genuine repentance. So as we partake together, let's do so by remembering that it's removed, it's paid for. Though our sins be as scarlet, He makes them white as snow. All we do, 1 John 1, 9, the Christian bar of soap, confess our sins, and He's faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ that we're celebrating. Would you partake with me? Thank you, Lord. Please stand when you're done. Kapuna, if you'll come up. Lord, thank you. First, thank you for this book of Ezekiel. What a rich time in Your Word it's been, going through this book. So many things. Thank You for including it in the canon of Scripture. Thank You for inspiring Ezekiel to write it, so that all these generations later we could be studying it, reading it, hearing it, taking it to heart. And Lord, lastly, thank You. Thank You for the cross. Thank You for Your blood shed for us. Thank You that our sins are forgiven. The weight of that sin completely lifted. The debt of that sin completely paid. Lord, how could we ever thank You enough? We too, like You, eagerly await for when what we just did here tonight is fulfilled in Your kingdom. That's too high for our understanding, that we're going to partake with You as Your bride by Your side at the wedding feast of the Lamb, when what we did here is fulfilled in Your kingdom. Lord, we can't wait. We eagerly await. We fervently desire. Jesus, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.